Bibles to our, our New Testament reading today, which is Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 35 to the rest of the chapter. I can't believe I said enduring the elder interviews. Did you catch that? <laughs> They're going to be hard. They're going to be really hard. Uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 35 to 45. Let's stand together for the reading of God's holy word. When we stand, we're not trying to be religious or anything like that. We're just acknowledging that God's word is infallible, that it is inerrant, and that it is the authority over our lives. And so we stand in his presence because when we read his word, it's as though God is speaking to us audibly. So authoritative is the written text. Mark 1, 35 to 45, listen now to God's word. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. Never forget one of the, uh, the travels that I made in my missionary time serving as a missionary in Africa sometime after college. Uh, my senior missionary gave me the assignment to go to a village called Kogo, and he told me before I left that if, if the original missionaries going all the way back to the early 20th century had not visited this particular village, that I might be one of the first people of, of European or Western descent to ever go to this particular village. And so he said, don't be surprised if the people are a little bit caught off guard to see somebody like you show up. And so it was one of the most difficult journeys I could imagine to get there. We had to hang on to the back of a truck for several hours and then we had to get into a canoe and we had to go upstream in the rain for three more hours then we had to get out of the canoe and take a hike. And by the time I went to this village, I was startled at uh, the people's reaction when they saw my, uh, my Western European descent face. Uh, many of them had never seen a person with my color of, of skin before. And so the men, some of the men kind of chuckled when I showed up and some of the women, uh, they would smirk and kind of laugh at me. I was beginning to feel embarrassed and it was the, the young people and the children though that made it all the worse. They would literally point at me and laugh, and they began to shout out the one word that I learned in their tribal language. It was the word ntan, which means white guy. There's a white guy here. And they laughed, and I, they, they thought of me as some kind of a spectacle or a novelty. And what, what made things worse, and this is a little bit embarrassing to admit, but here goes, what made things worse is that I had, had just broken out with a rash of ringworm on my body. Uh, if you've ever had ringworm before, it's not actually a worm, but it is, a, it is kind of an ugly, disgusting looking rash that you get on your body. We were in central West Africa near the equator, and so ringworm, it flourishes where it's hot and it's humid and it, you know, it's dank and those kind of conditions. So here I, I show up with a, a face, a coloration that they've never seen before, and on my body I've got this, this hideous looking growth on me, and so I wasn't surprised that they, they pointed at me and, and laughed at me, and it was the first time in my life, if I'm really honest, the first time in my life that I was embarrassed to show up in my own skin, if that makes any sense to you. I was embarrassed of my own appearance, embarrassed of my own, my own look. If, if you've ever experienced anything even remotely similar where you're uncomfortable with your physical appearance, 
Uh, maybe you're, you got your bad haircut, or maybe you broke out with an allergic rash on your body, or you had some other thing, you lost a tooth, whatever it is. If you've ever been embarrassed to show up in your own skin, your own physical appearance, then you have at least a fraction, a percent, a small little portion of what it might have felt like to be a leper. And today we're going to look at this incredible story, this incredible personal encounter between Jesus Christ and a leper. If anybody knew what it was like to be rejected, if anybody knew what it felt like to be despised, to be feared, to be scorned, to be laughed at, to be mocked, because of their physical appearance, of course, it would be in the ancient world, the people that we call lepers. And so we're going to look at this encounter today. If there's children here in the, in the sermon, my challenge to you, if you didn't leave for kids in training, is to draw for me today. Um, I, would love, I would love to see what you think the before and the after would look like for this leper as he meets Jesus Christ. What would he look like before he met Christ? And what would he look like after? I'd love to know what you come up with, children. So show me your pictures on the way out the door today. Let's look at a little bit of the context here of this passage before we get into the encounter. And uh, we're actually looking at two different paragraphs here. 35 to 39 is kind of its own literary unit. And then 40 to 45 is a literary unit of his own as well. But they do go together. And what's interesting about these two portions of Scripture is that if you'll notice, Jesus both begins and ends in a desolate place. Notice that in verse 35. Jesus is there in a desolate place. Why is Jesus out in a desolate place? Well, in the beginning of the story, he's gone out to pray. At the end of the story, in verse 45, Jesus once again goes out to a desolate place, but this time, it's not necessarily that he's going to pray, but this time he's been forced out of the towns and the villages because of his growing popularity as a healer and a miracle worker. Now, if you're asking yourself this question, why would the Son of God even need to pray? In that first little paragraph, well, we might actually pause there to contemplate that just for a moment. Why would Jesus need to pray? He's the miracle worker. He's the one that we're going to see throughout these passages, has the ability to cast out demons, to heal the sick. He's the one that's eventually going to still the storm and to walk on the water. Why would Jesus need to pray at all? Well, let's dispel a couple of false notions here. First of all, Jesus isn't praying so that he can inform the Father of the situation on the ground. The Father already knows everything. And nor is Jesus praying to come to him in, in repentance and asking for forgiveness of sins as we just did a few moments ago. Jesus is perfect. He has absolutely no need to repent. He has no sin to repent of. So that's not it. Why does Jesus pray? Well, maybe, maybe there's an example for us as the people of God that we too might pray in desolate places as Jesus does. Maybe it's because Jesus loves his unity with the Father and the, the, the Holy Spirit as well and that he finds that in prayer in desolate places he communes with the Father because he loves the Father and he enjoys to be in the Father's presence. And so I'll accept that. I'll accept that as another reasonable answer as well. But what we really want to look at this morning is this encounter with the leper. And so we're going to look at three facets of this encounter. Uh, first of all, we'll look at his desperate condition, speaking of the leper, his desperate condition. Secondly, we'll, we'll make some remarks on his bold approach to Jesus Christ. And then third, we'll look at his humble request. And in each case, we're going to take a look as well at what Jesus does in response to to the actions of the leper. So if you closed your Bible, let's go ahead and remedy that. Uh, open it back up to Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And let's first of all look at the leper's desperate condition. Verse 40, it says, The leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. So everything about verse 40 indicates to us that this leper is coming to Jesus in an absolutely desperate condition. Uh, we'll talk about what it means to be a leper here in just a moment, but notice even his physical posture. He is kneeling before Jesus. He comes and he, he, he almost veritably lays himself prostrate before the Lord. When is the last time you came up to somebody and physically got down on your knees to make a request? His posture is screaming out, help me. The word imploring means to beg him for help. And why is this leper begging him for help? Well, the, the answer is, of course, in the very word leper. He's got a very serious 
skin disease. Now, I want to just linger over this, what it means to be a leper here for moments. Uh, today, in the modern world, with all of our modern medicine and technology, we still have a disease that is called leprosy. Technically, it's called now Hansen's disease. It's caused by a mycobacterium leprae, it's called, and it does, it does work all sorts of ill effects on the body. Uh, it, it does cause blindness in the eyes if it gets into the eyes. It, it does cause facial disfiguration. It does cause your, your skin to open up into open uh, bleeding sores. It, it does cause paralysis in the tips of your fingers and your extremities. It's a, it's a terrible disease physically. It is, it is uh, difficult to look at, and yet in the, uh, in the scriptures... Because they were not able to as, as technically and precisely diagnose these sorts of things as we can do today through modern medicine, what they did in the ancient world is they basically lumped together all sorts of skin diseases onto one category, and they called that category leprosy. And so it might not have been what we would call Hansen's disease today, but they lumped it all together. And so I would have been considered a leper when I showed up in the city of Kogo with my ringworm on my body. That would have been considered leprosy. Uh, so too, if you have psoriasis or nobody know somebody who does, or if you have uh, open lesions on your skin or even a terrible case of acne or you have some sort of aller allergic reaction, all of those things were unknown in the ancient world. They were not able to diagnose them as accurately as we are today. And so any sort of skin disease or open sores, they would have lumped it together very suspiciously, fearfully, phobically even, as leprosy. They didn't understand how these things work. They didn't understand bacteria. They didn't understand viruses as we understand them today. And so we know, of course, that many of those things that I just mentioned are no threat to one's life or health at all. Uh, they can be easily remedied through all sorts of medications that we have available today. In fact, even Hansen's disease can be cured through a cocktail of various drugs and medicines that we have at our, at our disposal today. But in the ancient world, this was a very frightening scenario for the following reasons. Leprosy affected almost every aspect of your life. Physically, of course, if you actually had the real thing, the dehabilitation of, of hands and feet and toes and loss of sight, all of this was a physical threat. But more than that, socially, you would be cut off from the people of God and the people of your village or your city. Lepers were mandatorily quarantined into isolation or to groups that were sometimes known as leper colonies. And then spiritually, too, to have leprosy, according to the Old Testament law, and we're going to look at a couple passages here in just a moment, actually made one unclean or technically unfit, at least for the time, to gather together with the people of God and worship at the tabernacle or in the temple. So let's look at a couple of passages from the Old Testament just to show you the severity of, of this, at least in terms of the divine law. Leviticus chapter 13. Let's go there very quickly, church. Very quickly, Leviticus chapter 13. It says in verse 45 of Le Leviticus 13, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of the head fall loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. So you had to announce your own condition so that everybody around you knew it. And don't try to wear your best clothes. Don't try to hide it. Don't put any makeup over it. You have to announce verbally that you have this. In verse 46, he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. Okay, so if it cleared up, and it wasn't actually Hansen's disease. They didn't know that at the time. But if it cleared up on its own, then you would be declared a clean again. But as it is, he is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And so they were moved out away from the people of God or the people of their village. And Numbers chapter 5 is another one where this, this is spoken of. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or ha who has a discharge Everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead, you shall put them out, whether male or female, putting them outside of the camp, that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. You see that? So the reason is not only the physical region of the possible contagion, but also the spiritual 
reasoning of, of being made unclean and unfit for God's holy presence. And so leprosy was very often considered to be a judgment of God on a person's life, and we see that in a couple of places, not the least of which would be Miriam in the Old Testament and King Uzziah, both of which were struck with leprosy as a divine curse for their sin. You say to yourself, well, it's a good thing that I don't have that, right? No lepers here today, praise God. Good thing I don't have that. I don't want you to just think for a moment about how leprosy might actually be a type or a deep symbol of our sin. Because, think about this, doesn't sin have the same three negative effects on us as leprosy had on the ancient person? Sin disfigures us and makes us ugly if not physically, at least on the inside. Think of a man who has a terrible temper and how he might make himself ugly to his wife and his children because of the anger of his temper. Can you, can you imagine that? Or think of somebody who is pure and chaste but then gives themselves away to promiscuity. They make themselves ugly. They make themselves less attractive. The more promiscuous, the less attractive they actually become. They uglyify, if that's a word, their own soul. And not only that, but sin has social effects. It cuts us off from one another. It breaks us down. It removes one from the other. Sin breaks down marriages. Sin breaks down relationships. And so sin has a a social effect. And of course, it's sin that makes us unworthy to come into God's holy presence. So actually, it's kind of interesting here that leprosy thought of spiritually is something with which we have all in this room been diagnosed. We may not have Hansen's disease, but be sure that all of us in the room have Adam's disease. So what does Jesus do? Well, look at his response to this desperate condition. Jesus, the Bible says, and praise praise God for the love of Christ here. What does Jesus do? Is he repulsed by this man? Uh, Is he annoyed? Is he afraid of this man? No. The scripture says that Jesus is, look at verse 41, moved with pity. Moved with pity with pity. Jesus is not pitiful in the sense that he is to be pitied, but he is full of pity. What is pity? But but a deep affection of the heart that longs for the good of another. Pity is not when we feel sorry for somebody and then we walk away from them, but pity is what moves us into action. In fact, the the Greek word there for pity that's translated in your your New Testament is the word splanknizo, which literally meant the bowels. And so when you feel pity for someone, you feel it deep in your bowels. Have you ever felt that before? Have you ever saw somebody as somebody in a woeful condition, uh, just a lamentable state, and all you can feel it in your bowels, can't you? Right there in your gut. You feel that? And that's what the scripture says that Jesus felt for this man. He looked at him and he wasn't afraid of him. He didn't despise him. He didn't loathe him. But Jesus is moved for this condition. So let's look at number two, the leper's approach. Back to verse 40 again. The leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, I just need to pause here and just clarify this one thing, that when you were a leper, there was a, there was a social and civic parameter placed on your ability to approach somebody else, okay? Uh, Josephus, I think it is, one of the ancient historians, says that that distance, that proper distance is about 50 feet. In other words, Uh, The the sound of your voice as it travels normally, that's how close you can come to somebody else if you're a leper. You don't come any closer than than you can shout approximately. And so we actually see that as a way of example in Luke chapter 17. Remember the story where Jesus heals the lepers. It says, as Jesus entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Well, that's exactly what lepers were supposed to do. They were supposed to mind that distance. They were supposed to stay back 50 feet or the sound of one's voice. And yet here, watch this. What does the leper do? He breaks all social expectations in coming up to Jesus. He doesn't wait for Jesus to come to him, but he comes up to Jesus. People would have been in shock at this moment. 
This would have been absolutely inappropriate according to societal norms and standards. And you say to yourself, well, why couldn't he just come up with them? Anybody can come up to Jesus. But think about this. We, we have societal norms here about distance and approach in our society too. Think about this. If you go to the doctor's office, you know the drill. What do you do when you go to the doctor's office? What's the first thing you do? You sign in that little sheet, right? And then you sit down. And then they call you up, and then you sit down again, and then they call you up, and you sit down, and finally somebody says you can come back, and they take you back, and they put you in your little gown or whatever, and you sit there in that cold room, and what do you do then? You wait. And everybody knows that you don't run into the doctor's office, leap over the desk, and run straight back to the doctor. What would happen if you did that? You'd probably get arrested. That's exactly right. Can you imagine if this leper ran up on the Pharisees, what would have happened? Probably would have gotten stoned, okay? We know proper distances and how this works. The next time you're pulled over by the police officer for speeding, if instead of waiting in your car for him to come up to you, just try this next time. Tell him I told you to do it. Hop out of your car, run straight back to the officer, and hop in the car. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to jail, that's right. Because you don't just run up on him like that. And yet, here again, what does Jesus do? Now, Jesus' response here is absolutely compelling. This is the most gripping, compelling moment of the whole drama that happens here in this passage. Look at this, look at this, verse 41, you ready? Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. Let's pause right there. Question, when was the last time anybody touched this man? Weeks? Months? If he had Hansen's disease? Years? And Jesus' response in the leper's breaking of all social norms and expected mores, Jesus breaks one back. Do you catch that? When the leper breaks all protocol by coming up to Jesus, Jesus likewise breaks protocol by touching this man. Why did he do it? Let's consider a couple options here. Did Jesus touch the man to heal him? Well, we know he heals him. But is that why he touched him? Actually, when you look at the Gospels, throughout the Gospels, Jesus heals in a variety of ways. Jesus can heal any way he wants. Most of the time, if you study the passages, Jesus heals with a word. He speaks and somebody gets healed. And there's some other times where Jesus actually takes mud and touches a person. And there's another time, believe this, uh, he actually takes his spit. Jesus spits on a man and heals him with his own spittle. Why does he do that? He can do it any way he wants. On at least one occasion, Jesus healed the guy wasn't even in the room, wasn't even close. The centurion's son, Luke 7, this guy's not even present and Jesus can heal him. So Jesus didn't technically need to touch him in order to convey his healing power. Why does Jesus touch the man? Answer. Because he loves him. I think there's something there about prayer in as much as we too can run up to our Lord. We can run up to Christ. We can beg him for his help. We can call out to him with all of our needs without fear of rejection, without fear that he's going to loathe us or despise us. But before we close down this morning, let's look at at the last aspect here. That would be the leper's humble request. He says something here, and this is really profound. The leper says in verse 41, I'm sorry, verse 40, if you will, you can make me clean. If you will, that's the first phrase. That's a conditional. If means a condition is about to be introduced. If you will, comma, you can make me clean. That's a statement. That seems to have some implications to prayer as well, doesn't it? God, if you will, 
we know you can. So whenever we're praying, we're, it's, it's not that we're ever doubting God's power, right? It's not that we're ever doubting that God has the ability to, to do anything. God is omnipotent. God can, God can miraculously intervene in our lives in a, in a number of ways. The question when it comes to prayer is not whether God is powerful enough to bring about the result. The question is simply this, is he willing to do so? That's why the leper's statement there is absolutely right. There's no doubt about the power. The question is, does he will? We've all had experiences where we've had prayers that were answered, and we've also had the experience where prayers were not answered. What's the difference? Why does God answer some prayers and not others? Well, here's why. Some things he wills to say yes, and others he wills to say no. Well, how do we know which ones he says yes to? I'll I'll, I'll tell you which ones the Lord says yes to. The Lord says yes to the prayer requests in which he is most glorified and which is going to bring us the most good. And we often don't know the difference. Sometimes we ask for things that would not be to God's greatest glory. Sometimes we ask things that would not be for our greatest good. But the question is never about his power. The question is always, is the Lord willing to do so? And let's look at the result here in verse 42. Jesus said to him, and this is, this is just, this is so beautiful here, I will be clean. And so Mark tells us, Mark's favorite word, do, do you remember, what's Mark's favorite word? Immediately, there it is. Mark uses this word all the time, and here's one of those instances Mark says, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Remember also the word clean is about his physical health, but it's also about his acceptability into God's holy presence. So Jesus heals him in a number of ways. Um do want to look at the aftermath here. This is interesting. After the healing, which I, I would have loved, I would, have, I would do anything to be able to see this actually taking place. Can you imagine seeing the leprosy cleansing away from his skin and his, from his, his, his face and his nose made well and his eyes made right again and his, his hands and, and toes being restored? I would have, I would have loved to see this this physical healing here, but there's something else that's interesting that happens in this passage, and that after the leper is healed, Jesus gives him a very specific command. What is it? Look down at your Bibles. What does he say? Verse 44. See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. Now that seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? Why isn't he allowed to tell anybody? Wouldn't you think Jesus would say, now go out and tell everybody the change that has happened to you? Wouldn't you think? And yet, here's one of the great ironies of Mark's gospel is that multiple times throughout Mark, they call it Mark's messianic secret. It's a theme that runs through Mark's gospel. Jesus expressly tells people, don't say anything about this. Because Jesus, uh, for one, he doesn't want there to be any misconceptions about who the Messiah is and what he has come to do. And secondly, Jesus does not want the timing of God's perfect plan to be thrown off in any way. John's gospel refers to it as his hour. At his hour, he will come to the cross. And so the irony here is that um, the leper who was unacceptable, has now been made acceptable and is able to be received back into the community. But Jesus, who was already acceptable, now will be rejected because the leper does not obey his command. The leper goes and he tells everyone he can. I love the old King James. It says he published it and blazed it abroad. I love that phrase. And yet the, 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 uh, the unfortunate consequence that was that Jesus was no longer able to enter into the villages anymore. But you and I, we have no such restriction, do we? We can tell the world. That, that the command not to tell anybody, that has, been, that has been pulled back. Jesus at his resurrection, he told the disciples, go now and make disciples of all nations, discipling them, baptizing them, teaching them all things. And so for us, 
For us who are Christians, we have no limitation, we have no restriction on telling people what God has done for us and his saving work in our lives. And if you know Christ as your Savior, uh, let me simply say to you that your salvation is no less miraculous as that of the leper skin being cleansed here. You have been cleansed, you have been made acceptable to your holy God, and you have been brought into the community of his holy people. Let's pray and give thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful work, which in some ways is a, is a type of our own salvation, that, that we could not have come into your presence, Lord, because of our, our sin and our wrongdoing and our, and our guilt, but you made us acceptable, Lord, in your own eyes. You touched us by the healing and saving power of your mighty hand, and you, you have made us new and alive again. And so, Father, unlike the leper, we have no restriction on telling the world, but help us now to go out and to leave this place today and to make bold testimony of your saving love in our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Church, let's stand together. We're going